Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar. I would like to welcome you to our webinar, Comprehensive CRISPR-Cas9 Screens Identifies Important Factors for Plasma Blast Development. My name is Holly Bejnot. I'm a Senior Global Product Marketing Manager at Twist Bioscience, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Before starting, I would like to give you a few housekeeping guidelines. First, throughout the webinar, all lines will be muted. Should you have any questions, please submit it in the Q&A box rather than the chat box, and we'll answer all questions after the presentation. When you ask a question in the Q&A box, please be sure to share your name. That way we'll be able to get back to you after the webinar in the event that your questions remain unanswered. Following the presentation, if you have one minute to take a brief survey, we would really appreciate your feedback. And now I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Miriam Werner. After obtaining her PhD from the University of Erlingen in Germany, where she studied potential therapies for B-cell leukemia, Miriam joined the lab of Professor Meinhard Buslinger at the Research Institute of Molecular Pathology in Vienna, Austria. Here she worked on a variety of transcription factors involved in plasma cell development, germinal, uh, <clears throat> germinal center formation, and class switch recombination. <clears throat> Excuse me. This work included a comprehensive 3000 gene CRISPR Cas9 screen to elucidate novel factors important for plasma blast development. In 2022, Miriam joined the lab of Professor Feik Nimmerhian at the University of Erlingen, where she, where she currently is investigating the role of different macrophage subsets and metastasis development and growth. Miriam, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Holly. I'm actually having some problems. <laughs> now I think I did it. I hope you can hear me fine. Um, I had some issues with switching on my camera, ridiculously. Um, as Holly just said, uh, I'm glad to present my data about the crispr cas 9 screen that I performed um, while being in the lab of Meinrad Buslinger. I was actually supposed uh, to give this webinar already, already a year ago, but unfortunately, I instead ended up in the hospital with a close relative who just got an autoimmune disease. Um, and as bad as it is, I will just abuse the story to introduce you to autoimmune diseases, um, which are often caused or facilitated by autoantibodies. Those autoantibodies are produced by plasma cells. The plasma cells usually produce autoantibodies. Uh, produce antibodies which uh, protect us from a variety of different diseases. But in the case of an autoimmune disease, they now produce antibodies directed against cells. It's important to understand how exactly plasma cells develop and are maintained in order to now develop new and different forms of therapy targeting those rogue plasma cells. So let's jump right in. Uh, when a B cell encounters an antigen, it becomes an activated B cell. This activated B cell will now further differentiate into a preplasma blast, a plasma blast, and eventually into the plasma cell stage. For all of those uh, developmental stages, there are numerous factors known which are important for the development and the maintenance of the stage. And I just want to focus on some transcription factors for this introduction. Um, it's known that the fa factors IRL4, E2A, and E22, for example, block the developmental state, stage between the activated B cells and the preplasma plasma. Another factor called PLIM1 or PRDM1, and this is now important because I will mention this factor various times during this presentation, is actually responsible for the transition from the preplasma plasma to the plasma plasma stage. There is also other factors known which play a broader role and are essential for virtually all of those steps, like e and ALOS. So the question that we asked ourselves, do we really know the full picture of what is important for the plasma cell or plasma plus development and for the maintenance? And do we know all the factors that could potentially be targeted for therapy? So we decided to set out to do a screen of as many genes as possible, which might be essential for the plasma cells. So in order to do so, we use the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And I just really briefly want to introduce the system because I think it's broadly known what it is. But what you need is you need Cas9 and you need a single guide RNA 
which I from now, now on we call HTRNA, which actually guides the Cas9 to the side of the DNA where you want to cleave your DNA. For a screen like the one that we set out to perform, you want to target each gene with six uh, sgRNAs to make sure that uh, you don't have unspecific binding of one sgRNA or no binding at all. You use six of them if possible. And in order to get sgRNAs, which are perfectly tailored uh, to really nicely delete uh, our genes of interest, um, we use the BBC uh, sgRNA prediction tool that you can find via this link. And you can also find details on how the sgRNAs are predicted in this paper from the Zuba lab. Next, you need a system in which you can nicely cultivate your cells. So in our case, uh, we use the IgB system. This is a B cell culture system, which allows the B cells to be cultured for up to 10 days, which is a huge advantage to most conventional B cell culturing systems. And for this, you need this feeder layer of the uh, 40L B cells. Those are cells which express CD40 ligand, they secrete buff, and now you can additionally add IL-4 or later on IL-21 to your medium. So the IL-20, uh, the CD40 ligand and IL-4 will provide um, or will mimic T cell health, thus uh, leading to nice growth and uh, proliferation of your B cells. And buff is a survival factor. So you add your B cells to your culture, and now you can transduce your B cells, thus bringing the vector containing your sgRNA into the cells. As I will show you in a minute, this vector contains uh, neomycin resistance, so you can now select your cells of interest. And uh, upon adding IL-21 to your medium, your cells will differentiate into plasma plasma. As those plasma plasts can only survive if they have all the genes that are essential for plasma plasts, you can now um, find essential genes by sequencing which sgRNAs are in the plasma plasts. Because if the sgRNA had an essential gene, the plasma plasts won't be there any longer. So that's what you do in the next step. Um, you actually sort your populations of interest. You can now isolate the DNA. PCR amplify your sgRNAs, perform bioinformatical analysis, and then in the end you want to do single guide validation, thus proving that it's not an off effect of your pooled library that you saw, but actually an effect of your specific guides. So let's look into all of those steps in detail. Um, and as I mentioned, you do need cells which contain Cas9. So what you want to do is, um, or what we used uh, was a mouse, which constitutively expresses Cas9 from the Rosa 26 locus. And this mouse was generally provided by Hans Kleber's lab. Next, uh, you need to introduce your sgRNAs. So for this, we use this uh, PSG RNA vector, which contains a U6 promoter, a cloning site for the various sgRNAs that you need for the screen, a tracer sequence, uh, which you need uh, to PCR amplify your sgRNAs. It also contains Cy1.1, which is a marker for the efficient or for the transduction of the cell. So as soon as the cell is transduced, it will also express Cy1.1 on the cell surface. And uh, it also has a neomycin resistance, which is important to select for transduced cells. The sgRNA is, of course, essential for the system. And we ordered them from Twist Bioscience. And I just want to mention why this worked. Really, really great for us. So um, we were not sure whether we would be actually able to, um, to perform the screen in this big size that we're planning to do. So we ordered sgRNAs that we wanted in one big pool, but we left the option open to actually divide it into sub pools by a specific tag. So it was great that we had the option to either use everything or if we had realized that it was too much, just divide the pool. Uh, the ordering was super easy. So I basically just sent an Excel file containing uh, all the sequences. And then I got a tube bag which contained all the SGRNAs. So that was great. 
And uh, we also, of course, check that after the cloning of the sgRNAs into the vector, and um, when we did the actual sequencing of uh, of our cells, that uh, there were no missing oligos or that were no GC biases. And I just want to show you a picture um, from the end of the screen. So this is the pool, so just the sgRNAs without having been in a cell. And um, as you can see, most of them could be assigned and aligned, <laughs> and there was no GC bias. And also, this is a different way of looking at it, seeing whether they could uh, could be aligned or not. And there were basically, there was a very little percentage that could not be aligned. So this worked really, really great for us. So the next thing you need is a system in which you can screen. As I mentioned, we use the IGB system. So let's go into some details. So I isolated um, the B cells from the Cas9 mice. I stimulated them with LPSM L4. And then after one day, after they are properly activated, I transduced them with supernatant of uh, LANTX cells. After another day, the cells were now seeded uh, on the 40LB feeder cells, and they got additional L4 and the G418, so the neomycin. The cells were then allowed to grow for four days. At day six, a part of the cells was taken for sorting and then um, DNA isolation, while the rest was reseated on fresh flasks and uh, now received R21, thus initiating the plasma plus differentiation. And uh, I want to show you just the proof that the system works. So um, this is not the pool of sgRNAs. This is two specific sgRNAs. Uh, this one is the negative control. It will show up on various slide, uh, slides now. And this is an sgRNA targeting a region of chromosome 1, which doesn't contain any genes. And we also have this sgRNA directly against PLIMP1. PLIMP1 is essential for the transition for the, from the pre-plasma plus to the plasma plus stage. And how you can read these plots now is um, that first you can look at CD19, the B cell marker, just to exclude that we have feeder cells in our gating versus PI 1.1, the transduction marker. So you can distinguish the transduced cells versus the non-transduced cells. Always on the left is the non-transduced cells, and on the right are the transduced cells. You can now split up your cells into three populations by the marker CD20C against CD138, which will help you to distinguish the activated B cells from the preplasma plus from the plasma plus. And as you can see, on day six, there is no plasma plus in the system, as expected. Um, the differentiation only starts when you add IL-21. On day nine, for the control sgRNA, you can look again uh, at the non-transduced and at the transduced cells and look for plasma plus. And you can see that both of them nicely developed plasma plus. Now, if we take the sgRNA directed against split one we do find that the non-transduced cells, the 5.1.1 negative cells, still have a nice plasma plus population, while in the uh, transduced population, this plasma plus are completely gone, thus proving that our system works well for actually performing the screen. So now the question is, what do you want to screen for? Um, because genome-wide screens uh, would mean a lot of sgRNAs. So we decided for our first screen to actually go for all the genes which are upregulated either in the transition of the activated B cells to the preplasma plus or activated B cells to the plasma plus or from ex vivo mature B cells to plasma cells. So this is RNA-seq of the IGB cells of the various stages and this is um, RNA-seq of uh, ex vivo cells from the mouse. We did find a few hundred genes which are upregulated in the different stages. We did an overlap because a lot of those genes will show up in all of those uh, three RNA-seq, including the PRDM1, so the BLIMP1, IRF4, which I also mentioned before, and Syndicant. This is actually CD138, the marker that we used to actually gate for plasma plus. So in the first screen, we ended up with 1,000 uh, genes that we wanted to target. So a library of um, 6,000 uh, sgRNAs. In the second screen, we took the same RNA set. And here, uh, we now went for everything that is expressed in those cells with a TPM, that stands for transcripts per million, of at least five. 
those were still way too many genes. So we decided we needed to pre-filter and we went for categories of genes which sounded the most striking to us. So this is pre-filtered by us for um, transcription factors, chromatin modifiers, and many more. And the whole workflow to find this number of genes was, first of all, you take everything that's expressed, you take everything out that you already screened for the first screen, obviously, and then uh, we applied this filter for the different um, categories of genes, and then uh, we added our positive controls. So for the second screen, we ended up with 2,000 genes, meaning 12,000 SGRNAs. So what you want to do now after you um, clone your sgRNAs into your plasmid, you take the lente x and then you co-transfect them with your plasmid, a half a plasmid, and a, a eco envelope plasmid. And um, then you take the supernatant of your lente x and you want to transduce uh, your B cells. You want to aim for a transduction rate of roughly 10%, because if you have a too high transduction rate, multiple SG RNAs might end up in the same cell, which you want to avoid. So as you can see here, this is two days after the transduction of the B cells. You can now look for Thy 1.1, and you want to see that uh, the cells in a positive gate are roughly 10%. What you get at day, two, at day two is actually a smear because the Thai 1.1 seems to be expressed by the lent X cells and then co-transduced and stick to the B cells. That's why if you use Thai 1.1, you might want to wait for a few more days because at day five, you can quite clearly see which cells are actually really transduced. So in the case of this one milliliter of supernatant, we had a transduction rate of roughly 10%, which is what we were aiming for. So this was this is what we used for the screen, and this is now from the actual screen. So on day six, um, we took our sample, um, we gated for Thy 1.1 positive B cells, so the transduced cells. Those are now 22% because um, they've been selected with neomycin for four days at that time point. And then we sorted for the activated B cells. This is the reanalysis showing you that we actually got the cells that we were aiming for. And on day nine, we have more transduced cells because there's an additional three days of selection. We could start for pre-plasma plus and plasma plus. Again, the reanalysis showing you, yes, we did get pre-plasma plus and plasma plus. And just to give you an idea about the size of this whole thing, um, so for each sample, um, we had to plate the cells on 50, um, 75 square centimeter flasks. Those are those big tissue culture bottles, and um, we harvested, harvested all 50 flasks, and it took 21 hours to actually sort out 3 million plasma flasks. So the scale is huge um, because you have so many feeders and they're so hard to remove that you need to plate a lot of cells. So uh, we performed the uh, DNA extraction and the PCR amplification of the sgRNAs, and uh, then it was time for the bioinformaticians to do their magic. So they used this MacGeek um, protocol, where basically um, you do like for RNA-seq, um, you count, you do the pairwise comparison, and then they take all the guides and then they rank them. And basically in the ranking, that's also why you need six um, sgRNAs, it's if, if you have the ranking from high to low, and only one sgRNA is very far to the side. This wouldn't be considered an essential gene. Um, you need several of your sgRNAs for the same gene to actually be ranked on one of the sides to consider the gene essential. So the bioinformaticians calculated the log full change for the genes, which is calculated back from the log two full change of the guides. And then they calculated um, a false discovery rate and um, then generated as nice volcano blocks. So how you read them is you have the false discovery rate, which you want to be as low as possible. So everything as high up on this axis as possible is great. <laughs> and everything in the log two fold change to be on the left is great. So this would mean that everything that's in this upper left quadrant would be considered a hit in the screen. So the first screen, that's what we are looking at now, 
was all the genes which are upregulated either in the plasma blast or in the plasma cell development. So we expected that if genes are upregulated, they are important, but <laughs> the number of hits that we found was very, very small. So we did find back the syndica. That's good because, um, as I said, it's CD138. So uh, as we sorted for CD138 in the first place, that had to be uh, had to disappear. We found blimp one we found IRA4, and we also found some new genes. Um, but all of them are new. Um, the urn one is IRA1 alpha. Um, but yeah, we found some hits, but not as many as expected. Um, this is the comparison of day six activated B cells versus plasma plus. We also compared day nine pre plasma plus versus plasma plus, and there were even fewer hits, as you can see. We, we validated all of those hits, and um, how you read these plots is this is the plasma plus that you find in your transduced cell population versus your non transduced cell population. I will show you an example in a couple of slides. Um, but basically, your two negative controls, a vector without an sgRNA and this vector targeting the chromosome 1 MTA region, um, they are this high bar, while the sgRNA targeting blimp one is this low bar. So everything that's in between those two dashed lines would be considered a hit. The further down it is, the more important it probably is for plasma plus. And yes, we did find some hits like the SLC785 and the DNAJC3 and the Rexo2. But way more promising was our second uh, screen where you can see um, that we have a lot of hits. So we do find old friends. Um, we do find uh, TCF3, E2A. We do find PDM1, Blimp. We found Icarus. We found IR4. So this is all great. They were supposed to show up here and they did. But we also found a uh, big number of new and new factors that have never been implied um, to be important for plasma plus before. This is the comparison day six activated B cells versus plasma plus. And now here's day nine pre plasma plus versus plasma plus. Here the number of hits is smaller, but again, very low false discovery rate and a nice uh, log two fold change. So uh, we did the single um, guide validations. And again, just to show you how that looks, you transduce the cells with uh, an sgRNA targeting only your gene of interest. So this is not a pool. And now you can look um, how many cells are in your transduced gate and how many plasma plus do you find in this transduced cells. So here on the right. So for blimp one or PDM1, there is basically no plasma plus in this gate as expected. The two negative controls do have plasma plus. And now is one of our first hits, KDMA1, where the number of plasma plus is greatly reduced. We also found MAL2 in the BL to basically have no plasma plus um, in the transduced cell population. We found other hits like chunk 5, where you have plasma plus, but the number is reduced. And we found hits like PPP6C, where in the first glimpse it looks like we don't have plasma plus, so great hit. But then on the second glimpse, you see that you also basically lose all your transduced cells, meaning this is more an overall cell culture survival factor than an actual hit for the plasma plus development or maintenance. So we first looked whether we lose the transduced cells. So this is, again, our controls. And now everything that's below this dash line is considered to be just essential for the whole culture and not plasma plus specific. So we exclude some of our hits. They are all the white bars. But all the other bars um, are now considered to be hits. And again, the, the lower the bars are, the better um, the, the sgRNA is performed. And the more likely it is that we are talking about a gene which is really important for the plasma plus. So our top hits are TAF6, MAO2, NIPBL, STAT3, and then the list continues. So keep on saying all the gene names. So what did we actually find? So we found SLC7A5 and SLC3A2, which together form CD98. And actually, it's been shown that CD98 leads to a strong reduction in plasma, plasma, uh, plasma cell numbers. So proving, yes, what we did is valid. <laughs> we did find things that actually are or have been shown to be essential for the plasma cluster plasma cells. 
KDMA1 is a histone demethylase LSD1 and has also been shown to regulate um, the plasma plus differentiation. So what about some new hits? Well, for us, very exciting was the finding that uh, NIPL and MAU2 actually um, are both hits in the screen, they are both top hits, and uh, they've never been implied to be important for plasma cells or plasma plus at all. They are very important uh, for, for the DNA loop extrusion by cohesin, but why that would be important for plasma plus and plasma cells is up to whoever wants to do more research on our hits. So in total, we could confirm eight hits in the screen one and um, 39 hits in the second screen to be essential for the plasma plus without actually affecting the overall cell survival in the IGP system. Now, I need to mention all the people who helped with this uh, approach. So first and foremost, um, Meinhard Buslinger, who I, whose lab I performed the screen in, who was a really great mentor in this project. Um, then I want to really thank uh, Teresa. So Teresa is a PhD student. She's very, very talented, and she joined the lab where I performed the second screen. So she helped with the single guide validations and the follow-up um, validations of the hits. Maria Fischer is the bioinformatician, without whom, obviously, I wouldn't have been able to make sense of any of the results. And then I need to thank uh, Hannes Zuba and the members of this lab, Markus, Michaela, and Julian, who basically developed everything around it. They developed the sgRNA prediction, the vectors where the sgRNAs are in, and the whole cleaning up of the DNA, everything. So they are absolutely essential to perform the screen. And last but not least, I want to thank um, the IMP, whose great facilities are really top-notch <laughs> and uh, made this screen possible. So yeah, now I want to thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take any follow-up questions. Thank you so much, Miriam, for a wonderful presentation. Um, as Miriam mentioned, we're going to go ahead and now open it up to questions. If you have any questions, please make sure you ask it in the Q&A box. And to start off, we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll read off the questions to you, Miriam, and you can go ahead and answer them, please. Um, for, the first question, awesome. <laughs> um, for the first question here, is there a better way uh, or is there a better transduction marker than the thigh one? Um, yes, there certainly is. We used the thigh 1.1 because we had the vector including the thigh 1.1. Um, it's totally depending on which cells you want to look at. Like if you use cells which have the Cas9 but also have the GFP, obviously GFP is out of the question. But there is also other genes that you can bring into like, like human CD2, human CD4, human CD5, which all work nicely. The thigh 1.1 is nice if you have enough time for your cells to actually lose the one that is secreted by the um, lanty X cell. But if you only have a short time, I would definitely change the transduction marker, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. And for the next question, is it possible to perform this screen in vivo? It is, it is super hard. <laughs> so actually, uh, after I left, uh, the Bussinger lab spent uh, some more time trying to develop that, but um, you run into a lot of problems, starting from that um, in the mouse, there will be uh, um, specific clones of cells growing up, overgrowing the rest to keeping the representations really hard. So you need to add a lot of tricks and pieces, like um, how to improve the transduction rate and so on, but it's totally possible. I think there will be a publication, hopefully coming out soon, where they did exactly that, but not on the scale where, where we performed the screen in. Awesome. I'm interested to see that publication. <laughs> and um, moving on to our next question, did you encounter any off-target effects that affected the screen? Uh, that's part of the reason why we do the single guide validation at the end, um, just to make sure that, uh, I mean, by chance, it, could be possible that out of our six sgRNAs that we use for gene, two or three target another off target, not likely, but possible. But by performing in the end the single guide validations where you can also check whether the gene you're looking for is actually really down-regulated, you can validate for that, yeah. 
Awesome. And then it looks like we have one live question from John. Hi, Miriam. I'm so humbled for the great presentation. I'm a graduate student with MSc Biotechnology. Is there any possible window for a PhD? <laughs> well, you can text me directly with, uh, with shop offers or advertisements. I don't know. <laughs> Also, depending on whether you want to join me or mine, Rat. Uh, so, yeah, just text me. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Looks like that's all of the Q&A for today. Um, thank you so much for your time, Miriam. We really, really appreciate you giving this wonderful presentation. Um, Thanks for having me. <laughs> Awesome. Um, and as a quick reminder, before we close this out, um, following this, this webinar, you'll be redirected to a brief survey. If you have one minute to spare, we would really appreciate your feedback. Uh, thank you again, Miriam, so much. And thank you everyone for coming. We hope you have a great day.